Hi, this is Dr. Michael Horowitz with the Feet for Life Centers, bringing you another episode of Podiatry Help Desk. And today, we're going to take on the subject of whether or not it is best to use celastic implants or fuse the first metatarsal phalangeal joint or possibly use two component implants to solve the problem of degenerative joint disease of the great toe joint. Now, many of you that have done online research understand everything I just said, although it was a mouthful to some of you. I'm going to try to explain what I'm talking about. Over the years, there have been many processes developed to try to solve the problem of breakdown of the great toe joint. So here's an x-ray that shows what breakdown of the great toe joint looks like. These are called osteophytes. They're irregularities of the great toe joint. And if you take a look at the joint space itself, there's not cartilage, so you have literally bone on bone. Now you've heard this described before when it comes to hips and knees. Well, this can actually occur in any joint in the body. It occurs in the ankle, the subtalar joint, and even the first metatarsal phalangeal joint here. Now it can start with innocent trauma. Say you're a soccer player and you get stepped on or you stub your toe. This could start a process which leads to bone spur formation. Sometimes that's all there is, is simply bone spur formation, which is re relatively easy to handle. But when it gets to the point that you have a lot of breakdown of the cartilage, uh, you must consider other options or more essentially uh, sometimes more difficult options when it comes to solving this problem. That's because if you were to utilize, say, a simple option like what we refer to as a chylectomy, which is the simplest procedure that can be done for this particular problem, the removal of the bone spur, you, you might be left with chronic pain and just the problem is not solved because all you did was the minimum amount of work necessary to get uh, the bones essentially unlocked. So what I wanna do is discuss with you what we can do for patients that have this problem that have lived with it in a chronic way and maybe you've received a consult and you're confused about what the next step is. And what I specifically wanna address is this. What is the best option for you? Uh, when it comes to joint replacement versus joint fusion. Now, there are a large contingency of doctors on both sides of this issue, meaning some doctors really like the idea and practice with the idea that loss of function when it comes to solving this problem is okay. And they fuse the toe at an appropriate angle so that you can actually run toe off and it won't rub against the shoes. And this is a f process whereby you're actually fusing the joint. And there are some very uh, relevant uh, points here when it comes to biomechanics and fusion. So I'm not saying that fusion is a bad idea. What I am saying is that in my experience, many patients have been fused when they didn't have to be fused. And the reason for this, I speculate, is because there are many doctors out there that are trained certain ways. And we know, having been a residency director, I know that people take their training with them and sometimes it becomes something that they just utilize without questioning or learning other techniques. So there are a fair amount of doctors that are trained utilizing only fusions. They've seen fusions work and that's what they wanna do is fuse the joint. So fusion is simply fusion, using hardware usually to fuse the joint and taking off the joint surfaces. The process involves removing the osteophytes or the rough points of bone, removing the bone spur, and literally fusing the bones together. Now for many people that come into my office, this is not an option that they wanna hear. And that's because they've had some function of the joint and they don't wanna to totally lose the joint function. There are other reasons. If you go online, you'll hear stories about people who've had hardware issues or chronic pain as a result of fusion. This can come from the fusion actually not taking and sometimes occur because the hardware wasn't placed well enough to avoid problems, biomechanical problems, or even the hardware breaking. Now, how common is this? Well, it's a lot more common, unfortunately, uh, than you might think. Uh, so let me show you what I've seen just this past year when it comes to uh, fusions. And the reason I see all this stuff is because certain doctors in my area, I happen to be in St. Louis, Missouri, are flat out doing fusions all the time on many patients. And so that's their method of choice. And I'd assume that some succeed and some fail. 
So what I get in my office are the failures. In other words, these are people that have gone through the process and I'm going to point out what these failures look like and how they could have been avoided. And what I think you'll learn is that um, fusion on the wrong patient is oftentimes destined to fail. The fusion on the right patient is destined to succeed. I believe that the wrong patient is the more active patient. I believe that if you're considering correcting your first, met first metatarsal phalangeal joint arthritis with a fusion procedure and you are extremely active, that you could be better served by having an implant because it will preserve the function of the joint. Here's a case where a good friend of mine came in to me. He went to another doctor, the doctor fused him, and all the hardware broke. What I saw when I went into the joint was broken hardware. Now this hardware was difficult to get out because the screw heads were actually broken off of the stems of the screws. So not only did we have to remove the plates and the screws, but we had to dig into the bone to harvest those screws, which takes a certain amount of experience to do as atraumatically as possible. What we did with him was we replaced the joint with a Dow Corning Celastic implant. There are quite a few different hinged total implants out there. And it's a relatively simple procedure to perform if you've done it quite a few times. And this procedure will replace the joint and allow for an active range of motion. So here are the key pearls and what you need to know if you're going to consider fusion uh, versus say some sort of implant procedure. Number one, the alignment of the joint is important. Uh, the idea that all of the osteophytes need to be debrided off or essentially removed is also very important. On, in many cases, I've seen uh, physicians do procedures where they did, were not aggressive enough at removing the osteophytes, and so the patient lived in chronic pain because there was still bone-to-bone -bone contact. This is relatively easy to do, but you need to have exposure. There aren't a lot of doctors that make small incisions uh, that can cure this particular problem. So this is not an MIS type of surgery. Uh, this is an open procedure and you shouldn't be afraid of that because literally large incisions are completely okay if the dissection is done properly. Now what complicates the issue here, especially for these people that I've seen that needed revisional surgery, is that their capsules, their joint capsules were compromised. In other words, the, the, the neat dissection down through the capsule and exposure of the bone was done such that scar tissue formed and now we're going in through a, a second surgery and having to see what kind of preservation of capsule we can have and what we can do with the joint at this point. So again, the pearls are, are, are you know, they line up. After a while, it gets to be fairly complicated, to be honest with you. But what was necessary in this case is we needed to decrease the amount of adhesion plantarly around the sesamoid bones, use, utilizing a glamoury elevator, which is sort of like a sharp spoon. We go in and we release all the adhesions to allow the restoration of the joint itself. Then we clean up all the osteophytes or the dorsal spurs. We take out the joint mouse, mice. Joint mouse is simply a... Uh, a funny name for floating bone in the joint, which is not uncommon because bone breaks off in the joint. And uh, in the case of a fused toe, we remove the hardware and then we cut the bone in such a way as to put in a Dow Corning implant. So what are the advantages of the Dow Corning implant? Well, they're pretty obvious. You have a, a restoration of the range of motion. What are the ideal opportunities to put this implant? In, and that are that is simply do it first. If you were to put the implant in first, you could control the soft tissue dissection because you'd have fresh tissues, you wouldn't have scar tissue, and you probably wouldn't need to do any uh, releases of, of scarred or fibrous tissue. So one question you may have if you've had a fusion and it is chronically painful is, well, how is it possible to get this reversed? And the answer is an emphatic yes. I've reversed many, many procedures because quite frankly, there are doctors in this area that tend to fuse a lot of patients. And there's a certain number of them that come into me with fusions that they're not happy with. Does that mean that all their fusions are bad? Absolutely not. There's, there's definitely uh, a case that fusion can be very, very effective. But what I'm telling you is that sometimes if you make that choice you've made, and, and it's the wrong choice, 
it's more complicated to uh, go into a joint uh, procedure that preserves the range of motion. Now, you're not preserving the joint, obviously, when you do a, um, an implant, you're actually take, removing the joint. So let's talk about, for a minute, the differences in joint implants. There are various com uh, two component implants. Some consist of a metal component and a polypropylene component. Others uh, consist of celastic. What I'll say is this, as you know, I'm not a big advocate of putting metal in the body, but sometimes when you have joints like this, this is what the technology offers us until we get into uh, um, other uh, uh, materials and properties like maybe ceramic in the future, we're stuck with um, metal and celastic. I will say this, that I've been very successful putting in celastic implants. I think that if you get a good clean capsular closure and you encapsulate the implant, it's very helpful. And most helpful of all is early range of motion, which simply means this, after the surgery, almost literally hours after the surgery, if you perform range of motion exercises, you end up with great results. So I'll show you a couple patients that I've recently done. Here's a very athletic patient. He allowed me to use uh, his foot. Uh, we'll call him Jeffrey. Uh, Jeffrey was a very athletic 60-year-old who was running five miles a day, and we implanted him with the Dow Corning implant. He, I want to reiterate that the reason he was happy is because he started very early doing range of motion exercises, and possibly he had a surgeon, myself, that had experience with this particular procedure and was able to do this with a good, clean capsular closure where you're opening the patient in layers and you're closing in layers. So this concludes part one of our three-part series that discusses in detail first metatarsal phalangeal arthroplasty and first metatarsal phalangeal joint fusion and reversal of fusion if necessary. And I want to also let you know that the next video involves going into Missouri Baptist Hospital. It's a video of a first metatarsal phalangeal arthroplasty procedure that I perform. And it's as I'm performing this procedure utilizing a Dow Corning implant. I am explaining the procedure in detail step by step.